Well, it is a new day. It is a new week. It is a new month. So what better way to start off all that newness than with a new series? We're starting off a new series here today. Uh, We're going to be talking about our identity, our identity in Christ. How are we identified? The Bible says that when we accept Christ, that we have been established as being a part of Christ. Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27, it says, All who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. Who likes new clothes? I I like new clothes. I'm not your typical guy. I talk about that all the time. I love a new outfit. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for all are one in Christ. And these clothes you wear, I, I like to look, I like to stand out a little bit every now and then. I, Christy never lets me get the shirts I want to. I, I always want to get some of the more vibrant ones. She, she doesn't allow me to get this. She tells me it doesn't match with my complexion or something like that. I don't care, man. I, I, I enjoy a more vibrant outfit. I really do. But we are meant to be noticed. As be, you are meant to be noticed. You are meant to be easily identified. You are meant to be recognized. You are meant to be identified as a follower of Christ, and not just by other people, not just by other people. I mean, Jesus said in Matthew 5, you are the light of the world, a city on the hill, shining light in dark places for other people to see. You are the salt of the earth, adding flavor, adding seasoning to a bland world. But also, you should be able to identify yourself. You should be able to look to yourself and say, whose you are. Oh, I was once this way. I once acted this way, but now I am a new creation. Who I once was is gone. I am now a new person. And that's what we're going to be looking at over the next five weeks. What are these traits that make us as identified in Christ? This morning for our opening identifier, we're going to look at the status that we are meant to stand in. I want you to look at the Word of God with me at Romans chapter 8. I'm going to read to you about six verses here today, six, seven verses, but they flow quickly here. Romans 8, Paul, he says, What shall we say about such wonderful things things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one, for Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us, and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Can anything separate us from Christ's love? doesn't mean that he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or are hungry or destitute or in danger or are threatened with death. I mean, the Bible says, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, say all these things. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. I'm telling you what, this morning, you've already sang the message. You sang the message, but now it's time to hear the message. It's time to work our victory. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word today. Your word that has been already validated through the worship of your people. God, we ask, Lord, now that you would begin to seal the word within us. Lord, let us leave this place walking and working in the victory you have asked us to. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So for most of us here today, this is not an uncommon section of Scripture. Most of us have heard it or have said it multiple times. We read it. Uh, it, It's that incredible chapter of Romans chapter 8. If you need to be encouraged, go to Romans chapter 8. Uh, Most of us, we would have quoted verse 37 the uh, way that uh, most of us probably memorized it. It says in most translations, there is, uh, we are more than conquerors. We are more than conquerors. 
But today we read Romans 8 out of the New Living Translation. I'm actually reading through the New Living Translation this year, my personal Bible reading. I like to kind of switch up, bouncing between different translations year to year to year. But this year I'm on the New Living Translation. And typically, even on Sunday mornings, no matter what I'm reading personally, usually we read the NIV translation here. But there was something about the way that Romans 837 is worded in the New Living Translation. And I just, it, it gets me excited. It gets me pumped. It gets me excited. It gets me thinking so much about the identity that we are supposed to take on because we are in Christ, despite all these things. Overwhelming victory is ours. I love that phrase, overwhelming victory. We are identified by a victory that has been unchallenged, that is undisputed, and is undefeated. We are identified by a victory that belongs to me because I belong to Christ. His identity as victor has become mine. And it's ironic to me that that status of victory and that victorious position is only achieved because we have done what would normally be considered an act of defeat. We have surrendered. The act of surrender is only applied when there is no pathway to be able to win. When there is no way, uh, 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 no way for us to be able to succeed is when you wave the white flag of surrender in war. But it's because that I have surrendered my life, my will, and my heart to him that I can live in victory with him in my life. And of course, most of us would know, and many of us by firsthand experience, that just because I can live in victory doesn't mean I will live in victory. There are many believers that live outside of experiencing true victory in their lives. I mean, it's they continually, sometimes we continually struggle with sinful and emotional strongholds within our lives. Habits that we just can't seem to shake and to break. Anxieties and fears that we can never really get over. And I'm sure there are many reasons why we fail to live in overwhelming victory. And this week, I try to kind of narrow it down to maybe three specific reasons why. They're not on your notes here this morning, but three reasons why we don't live in victory. First of all, we don't live in victory because we think it's not for me. You think, oh, it's not for me. Oh, I know overwhelming victory is for you, Brother Chris. I, I know it's for you, but it's not for me. I, I know overwhelming victory is for people who serve in the sound booth, right? For a group of people that are so faithful every single week, they get here, they come on Thursday night practice. Of course, overwhelming victory is reserved for them. For people that come out and, and work for six to eight hours in a yard sale in 80, what feels like 95 degree weather, but it's not for me. And I continually to believe that. I'll listen to the guilt and the shame that the enemy whispers in my ear. Yeah, you've done too much. It's not for you. Sure, you might be saved, but you're only his once you get to heaven. While you're here on earth, you're mine. It's tragic, isn't it? We believe the lie. Victory, it's not for me. I'm doomed to live in hardship after hardship. I'm only meant to go and to traverse and struggle after struggle. Yeah, I know my sins are forgiven. I know my punishment is subdued. Overwhelming victory, one day, but not today. Another reason why we don't live in overwhelming victory is because we don't think victory is sustainable. It's not sustainable. Victory, it's temporary. It's, it's an emotional high. We, we come home from church where we had such incredible, victorious worship, or maybe we go to a revival service, a conference, something like that. We get all pumped up and we we're living in victory for a few hours, a few days, a few weeks, and maybe even in sometimes a few months. But sure enough, something happens, biology 
kicks in or I'm going to be triggered by someone or something. And that, that disposition that I always seem to fall into, that natural inclination begins to rise back up within. And I start to tell myself, well, victory, it's just, it's not sustainable. I still have to deal with the same things that I always have. This has been in my family for generations. It didn't start with me and it's not gonna end with me either. My father dealt with it. His father before him dealt with it and his father before him dealt with it. And on and on and on it goes. This is just the way it is. Final reason why we won't look at victory as something that is for us is because victory is not worth the effort. The road to victory is too long. The commitment to victory, it's, it's too hard to maintain. The, the price of victory, it's, it's too steep for me. If victory means that I have to give this up, then <laughs> no, thank you. No, thank you. I, I enjoy being able to kick back a cold one after work, after a, a long and lousy day. If victory means I have to give that up, I'm not going to give that up. If, if victory means I'm going to have to give up my, my anger, my resentment, my bitterness, my unforgiveness, oh, you better believe I'm not going to give that up. Victory is not worth letting them off the hook. Do you know what they did to me, God? Victory is not worth the effort. Enjoy the satisfaction that living in victory, lack of victory rather, brings me. Listen to me this morning. I'm not here to cast shade or condemnation on anybody struggling or continuing to live outside the scope of overwhelming victory this morning. This message is meant to encourage and to equip you today that victory is available for you today. His victory is your victory. He is overwhelmingly victorious, so you will be overwhelmingly victorious. You are not meant to be known by what you has overcome you. You are meant to be identified by what you have overcome. You are victorious. And whatever the reason is that you have for not identifying as an overwhelming victor today, let me remind you, God has your back. He has your front. He has your sides. If God is for us, who can be against us? Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is mine through Christ Jesus who has loved us. Obviously, overwhelming victory doesn't come with my effort and my share of what I've got to put into the equation as well. I mean, the last reason that we have for not living in it this morning is it's not worth the effort. Victory is not supposed to be easy or effortless. It's not supposed to be easy or effortless. And this morning, I want to answer the question, how do I work my victory? The answer can entail a long process and hard work, but I promise you it will be worth the work. First way, how do I work my victory? This morning, learn an attitude of victory. You got to learn an attitude of victory. For me personally, usually my biggest failures have something to do with my attitude. Something to do with it. It's not often, but every now and then, something will set me off. Something will get me all grumpy. Something will get me angry. Something will get me cynical. And it just, I stay in that mode for maybe a day, maybe a couple days. But the enemy was working hard this week on my victory. About two, three years ago, we had a sign up on UPS to redirect a package from an address that we sent it to in the wrong place. And we had to send it to uh, like a UPS store so that it didn't get delivered to a wrong house. And I have never used that service ever since the one time I did. And three times in the past month, UPS has taken packages that should go to my house. Not every package. We do a lot of online shopping. That's just the way we roll as a family. We, we like the convenience of it, having it shipped to our door within two days. It's fine for us. 
And so not even every package, but three times in the past month, UPS has taken packages that should have come to our house in Avon Park and sent them to an advanced auto parts store off of Clubhouse Road in Lakeland. They call it their access point. And honestly, I know it's inconvenient. And if they're short staff, short driver, I'm, I'm perfectly honest, I'm okay with the inconvenience if they would ship it to the access point. That's at CVS, just on the other side of 27. I'd be fine with that. I'd deal with that. Not 45 minutes away. One time I dealt with it when I got the notification that two of my packages were going up there. You better believe I called them. You better believe I called them. And generally, I work with the mantra and the motto that you win more f flies with honey than you do vinegar. And so I like to try to be pleasant. Even when I'm upset, I try to be pleasant. I really try to be. This week, I was working on my victory. I had to work on my victory. These people knew I was not happy. In fact, I am writing literally this point as I'm on hold multiple times. And I know that once I get off the phone, I'm going to have to have a choice to make. What kind of attitude am I going to live in? I'm going to have to work for my victory in here. I'm going to have to work for my productivity to make sure that I finish this message. I'm going to have to work for my pleasantness because Sister Margie's just next door to my office and she's hearing me. I'm not quite yelling, but I'm not quite talking. I'm not quite talking to like the normally chipper self that I talk in. I know that in order for her to want to come back to work this week, I'm going to have to work for my victory. My attitude for the rest of the day would be my choice. It could ruin my day or I could learn or I could choose the correct attitude and live in overwhelming victory. You want to hear an unpopular truth this morning? Your attitude is your choice. Your attitude is your choice. You might argue with me, oh, I can't control my attitude. Sure you can. It might take some time. It might take some practice. It might take a few mistakes, but it might take a little bit of work, but eventually you can work and point your attitude in the right direction. In the course of the day, I might not be able to choose what happens to me, but I can sure choose how I respond to it. The enemy wants your victory. He wants your victory and he's going to try to get you to hand it over to him any way he can. It might be as simple as an email. That's what did it to me. Two emails. We've sent your packages to this address. 45 minutes. And he wants your victory and he won't even do anything complicated to get it. But when victory is on the line, you have a choice. Are you going to contemplate or are you going to complain? That's what Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. You better know what you're going to do. Choose to contemplate whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these kinds of things. Oh, contemplate the truth of it. Like Christi, Sister Christie already preached, you're not fighting for victory. You're fighting from victory. It's not about what I do to win. It's about what he's already done to secure my victory. Even if I'm still waging the battle, the war is over. The defining work of victory is complete. Jesus has done all that needs to be done for me to live in overwhelming victory. Contemplate the pure and the lovely gift that God has poured out upon us. It's hard not to smile when you know you're getting a present. It really is. And I've never seen, and it's rare to see anybody get a gift and not come away from it with a smile on their face. It's just the very nature of what gift giving is and what a gift we have received in Jesus. All my sin is gone, forgotten as far as the East is from the West. And he has come in service and in sacrifice for me. No ulterior or selfish motives. Genuine love and concern for my well-being. Oh, learn an attitude of victory today. Learn where your victory stands today. Contemplate the pure and the lovely gift of what your victory is. It takes time. It takes working through the setbacks. 
It's hard work to dig up reasons to look at things that are pure and praiseworthy and admirable and to find valid examples in your life, but maybe that's the point of it. Maybe that's the whole point of trying to to plow these new mental pathways within our mind so that our mind doesn't automatically go to something cynical, but it goes to something praiseworthy in the end. Learn an attitude of victory today. Secondly, how do I work my victory? Practice actions of victory. If my biggest struggle usually centers around my attitude, I wish I could be able to say that my actions are flawless, but unfortunately, that's not the case. Unfortunately, sometimes my actions need some work as well. Sometimes I blow it. I say something that I shouldn't have said. I I do something that I shouldn't do. There's just this external pull that just keeps on seeming to pull me towards things that I shouldn't do. You know what that's called? Temptation. Look what the Bible talks about temptation. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Look at this verse. Just break it down with me for a couple seconds here. I love that opening line. No temptation has overtaken me except what is common to man. Oh, that's comforting. Oh, that's so comforting to me. And what I'm struggling with, my brothers in this room, you struggle with. My sisters in this room, you struggle with. And what we struggle with together, there's people in churches and there's people in in communities all around this community that struggle with the same thing. And we as people, what we struggle with, the Bible says Jesus struggled with the same thing, yet the difference is the Bible says that he struggled, but yet he did not sin. Temptation isn't something to feel guilty over. It's part of the human condition. Flesh is going to be drawn to fleshly things. No temptation has come across my path that isn't common to man. The verse continues, and God is faithful. That sounds like a sermon series. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. This is one of those verses, man. It just always gets taken out of context. Always gets taken out of context. Not maliciously or anything like that, just just mistakenly. Because it feels good to be able to say, God's not going to let my trial overcome me. God's not going to allow my sickness to overcome me. It it feels good to say he's not going to give me any more than I can bear. But that's not the, 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 the scope of what Paul is talking about here. The trial that he's talking about isn't how we define the trial. He's talking about temptation in my life. And the Bible is clear that temptation, it's not from God. James chapter 1 says, when tempted, you should not say that God is tempting me because God cannot be tempted, nor does he tempt anyone. Temptation isn't from God, it's from the enemy, but temptation is allowed by God into my life, not to crush my victory, but rather he allows temptation in my life so that he can do his part for my victory. And then comes what he does. He will provide a way out so that you can endure it. And here's the crux of our second point here today, practicing actions of victory. It's simply taking advantage of the ways of escape he's orchestrated. Some of the ways out, they may seem inconsequential. They may seem that way. Nothing is farther from the truth. Some of the ways he's made out for us may seem inconvenient. Nothing could probably be closer to the truth. It's probably going to be inconvenient. But rest assured, the right actions combined with his opportunity produce overwhelming victory in my life if I am ready to work for it. What opportunities does he give us to be able to work victory in our life? Well, there's some of the obvious ones. Obviously, we can pray. 
But why not we start praying before the situation escalates so that we don't have to pray because the situation escalates. These are actions of victory, not playing catch up, but preventative prayer, so to speak. How about reading and memorizing scripture? This is what Jesus did. Jesus, he knew the word. And so when he's in the desert and he's being tempted by Satan, oh, tell these, uh, these, these stones to become bread. Throw yourself down. Bow down and worship me. And he combats the temptation with the written word of God. And each and every time he is victorious. How about the practice of worship? Man, if you're utilizing Sunday morning at 10 a.m. from 10 to 10.20 to 10.25 for as your soul time of worship during the week, you are missing out. You are missing out on overwhelming victory. Get a YouTube playlist. There might be a random ad in it from time to time, but that's okay. You'll find victory even through the ads. Type in worship playlist on YouTube. They got them as long as a day straight, and you can just have it there. Practice the act of worship. Try giving. I'll leave it up to the preacher to find a way to slip giving into a message about victory. Oh, but it's true. Could maybe the victory that you're lacking still be held into the fits that you're clenching? Try giving. I mean, Jesus gave, he sacrificed. And what's the byproduct? It is victory. It's victory. The victory you're looking for might be just in what it is that God is asking you to give up. Make predetermined choices. Make predetermined choices. Last week, Pastor Johnny, he was here. He's talking about standing firm to the end. And man, he, he brought up the ever-relevant example of Walmart. Usually I bring Walmart up at least once a week and he did it in my stead last week. I was so happy. I didn't even ask him to. And he's talking about driving through the Walmart parking lot for 10 minutes looking for a driving or a parking space. And then you finally find one and he's heading towards it and a car whips in ahead of him. Sounds like a firsthand experience to me. All the while, I'm thinking, Pastor Johnny, you need to have a predetermined choice. I have a predetermined choice. When I go to Walmart, I park in the back. I park in the back of the parking lot. Victory is in the back of the parking lot at Walmart, guys. It's in the back of the parking lot. There's no stress in the back of the parking lot. There's no arguments in the back of the parking lot. It's wide and open in the back of the parking lot. You can pull right out easily in the back of the parking lot. You can walk in and have time to get your mind in the right place before dealing with Walmart in the back of the parking lot. It's a win, 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 win situation. Make predetermined choices. The enemy, he's coming to defeat you. Practice acts that keep you standing in victory. Lastly today, how do I work my victory? Declare answers of victory. It's mentioned last today, not because it's unimportant or ineffective, but rather responding in victory. The placement is what you need to look at. This point is last because it's improper to place it anywhere else but last. What I say must be validated by what no one else can see what I'm thinking about. What I say must be validated by what everyone else can see, what it is that I'm doing, the actions I'm doing. Actions speak louder than words and thoughts drive actions. And sometimes well-intentioned people, not, not malicious people or anything like that, but well-intentioned people, they'll just come up and just start talking. Oh, you just got to speak your victory. You just got to speak it, speak it, speak it, claim it, claim it, claim it. And then when you start claiming it and nothing seems to ever happen, you might think it's silly or worthless or worthwhile because it's been done out of order. If it's not done in the context of my attitude changing and my actions changing along with it, it is going to be a futile step. When speaking victory, make sure it's in proper order. Once I've learned an attitude of victory, once I've practiced actions of victory, declare the answers of victory. Declare them by faith. Declare what is not as though they are. 
declare uh, declarations and answers that allow the abundance of the hope in my heart to be able to speak and to pour out. Declare answers that speak life because it's out of the tongue that flows the power of life and death. These sure sounds like the, the difference between victory and defeat to me. Defeat occurs when it's conceded to. <clears throat> so stop speaking death over your life. Stop speaking destruction over your life. Stop speaking despair over your life. Rather do what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. We demolish every thought, every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Take captive every thought. Answer it with a response of truth. Oh, the enemy will come in and he'll creep just this little thought in your head. Oh, I'm worthless. I have nothing of value to add. And yet there's an answer to that to be declared that says, oh, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Take captive that thought. The enemy will come in and he'll, he'll sow in this thought that I'm alone. And nobody else is going through what I am. But yet the word says that he will never leave me nor forsake me, that I'm his child. The enemy will come in and he'll start pointing out that my life is pointless, it's, it's empty. But yet the word says, so declare the word that he has come that I would have life and have it to the full. The enemy will come in and he'll start saying things like that. You have no purpose. You have nothing of value to be able to add to, to, add to anything. But yet the word says, so declare it, that he has a plan and he has a purpose for me. The word says, the enemy comes and says, oh, you're not going to survive this. But the truth that you should declare this says, if God is for me, who can be against me? Overwhelming victory is mine. It's yours today. It's yours today. Say that with me. It's mine today. You know, you would think after a couple of weeks of kind of contemplating and meditating on this and these scriptures, and you would think that preparing a message on victory would have been rather simple. But I'm telling you, this week, this message was a labor of love, that this message was a work that needed to happen. I shared with you a little bit about what happened Thursday, but Wednesday wasn't much better. Wednesday, nothing is crazy, but just Christy and I, we had to do something in the morning and it just kind of set the tone for the rest of the day for me. I just found myself in a funk for the rest of the day to where I just was really just uncertain about a lot of things. I was unmotivated. I felt ineffective. And even the flow of this whole series, I just really wasn't even confident in victory, especially in the latter half of the week was work. It was work. Where does your victory need work today? Where does your victory need work? Is it in your patience, how you deal with, respond with to other people? Where does your victory need work today? Is it in your peace? The anxieties and the fear of your heart, they just seem to be so overwhelming and so, so overbearing. Where does your victory need work today? Is it in the habitual practices that you've been speaking life over, you've been speaking change over, but maybe they're just not, nothing's quite gelling and just one thing always leads back to another. You keep on finding yourself back into the same ruts. Wherever it is this morning, the enemy wants you to believe that it's a lost cause. Wherever it is this morning, the enemy wants you to believe that victory, it's never going to happen. Wherever it is this morning, the enemy, he wants you to believe that you can lose your victory. Let me tell you this morning, that is a lie. You cannot lose your victory. You can't lose your victory. It is yours. You can forget your victory. You can develop a spiritual amnesia and you can forget your victory, but he cannot take your victory. It is yours if you are in Christ. It belongs to you. So as he uses every struggle, every storm, every sin to try to get you to forget it this week, 
remember to work your victory this week. You are identified as victorious. Overwhelming victory is yours. Believe it. Overwhelming victory is yours. <laughs> work it. Overwhelming victory is yours. Live in it this week. With every head bowed, every eye closed this morning,